All right, good morning. Welcome to the first of our short learning videos. Uh, today's topic is going to be preparation tools, what they are, how we use them. The outcomes for this, your, your learning outcomes, will be to identify various tools and their uses and perhaps understand their limitations. There's a time and a place for most tools and it's important that as decorators we recognise what tool best suits which task. The first thing we need to consider as decorators is we need to work in a clean environment. Paints, varnishes, other decorative finishes do not work well in a dusty environment. So we need a hoover. We also need the humble dustpan and brush. Right? Uh, not high tech kit at all, but it does the job very well and keeps our working environments and the surrounding area clean and tidy. With the preparation bits and pieces, we also need our dusting brush. This is a mixed hair brush. There are some hog hair in here and synthetic bristles. Um, just means we can dust off any surfaces prior to painting. Right? And the dust doesn't hold in here because of the type of bristle. Right? So a very effective piece of kit. And as a decorator, that's one of three you should always have in your pocket. Right? So that is your dusting brush. Right. Abrasive papers. All right. This is where we create most of our dust as decorators. This is not sandpaper. Right? Sandpaper is a museum piece. You can't find it anymore. That was quite literally sand stuck to paper to create an abrasive surface. What we have now is still some glass paper, which is useful for um, taking off perhaps particularly heavy uh, paint work or for smoothing off uh, rougher wood. What we have here is aluminium oxide abrasive paper. Right. We've got two, what we would call textures, it's referred to as grit in the trade. We have 80 grit, which is a more coarse abrasive paper, and our 120 grit, which is less abrasive. As a rule, the higher the number, 120 to 40, 400, the finer the uh, texture on the abrasive paper is becoming. The lower the number gets, right, 100, 80, 60, even 40 is getting a lot, lot coarser. All right? You will need to look at the job that you need to prepare and decide what sort of abrasion you need. On um, particularly rough surfaces, heavy paintwork, etc., you may start off with some 80 grit, and once you've got the worst of the, uh, what we refer to as snots, nibs, runs, snags, and other defects off the door, um, or even walls, you would then go over with some 120, and that takes off the, the last of the uh, scratch marks left there by the 80 grit. So the aluminium oxide is for dry abrading. You may have heard in the past the expression wet and dry. Wet and dry abrasive paper is this stuff. This happens to be a sheet of 120. Again, it goes to 200, 240. Um, the guys in the car body repair shops will be using four or even 600, very, very smooth stuff. But the principle is the same. Uh, we have our piece of piece of paper. We always fold it into three parts. The reason for that is we only fold it in two parts. As we're trying to abrade, the paper actually starts to flex, which means it's not doing its job in abrading. So by folding it into three, whether it be dry abrading or wet, it can't move. All right, which means we have a very effective abrading, um, abrade, abrasive paper. Now then, with the wet abrading, what happens, we put the silicone carbide into water, put that against the surface we want to abrade, and start moving it around. Circular motion normally, right? Bit more water back on there. And what this does is it builds up an abrasive slurry between the surface and the silicone carbide paper. So we've got the rough texture of the paper, any grit that we're taking off, that gets trapped in the water and is a very, very effective way of getting rid of uh, snots, runs, sags, other paint defects, particularly on doors. All right? We wouldn't really use this on walls, but for woodwork, metalwork, this is a very, very effective um, way of abrading. The advantage of this is not only is it very effective, it's also dust free, all the dust is trapped. Right, the disadvantage, it is more time consuming right, and can be a little more messy if you're not keeping an eye on how much water you are throwing around the place. The aluminium oxide abrasive paper, again, we would fold into three, rub it against the surface. Right, 
The advantage is it might be slightly quicker and less messy. The disadvantage is it's not quite as effective as wet abrading and we have the dust going up in the air, all right? Which then has the uh, health and safety implications. We now need to wear dust masks, all right? Maybe cordon off the area, stop the wind blowing through so the dust actually settles. So pros and cons for each type of abrasive paper. As well as the abrasive papers, there's, uh, we have three types of hammers that we sometimes use uh, as part of our preparation process. We have the chipping hammer, right? We have the pin hammer, which we use for glazing. They look remarkably similar, but the pin hammer, as you can see, is much smaller, much lighter, so we can use that near glass when we're glazing, just for putting in very small pins prior to the, putting the putty in. So that's your chipping hammer and your pin hammer. The one you'll be most familiar with is your claw hammer. Okay, we can bang nails in, pull nails out, and the nail punch as well, that will go on a protruding nail head, right? That knocks a nail into the wood. And if we do dent the wood, it is a much smaller dent than the size of the hammer head. So that's why we use a nail punch in conjunction with the claw hammer. We also need our screwdrivers, all right? Sometimes you just have to loosen a few bits and pieces. Okay, so we have our posi drive and our slotted or flathead screwdrivers just for various bits and pieces we may have to loosen. We also have a wire brush, very useful, okay, for getting flaky paint off metal work, other bits and pieces. We can use it on masonry, although I'll be careful about that because if the wire bristles come out in the masonry, we overpaint it, it then can rust slightly the bristle and you'll have a little coppery um, wire poking through. So a non-metal block brush would be better for masonry, but your wire brush, brilliant for flaky metal work. On to a selection of other bits and pieces now for removing paint and filling. So first thing we have here is our universal shave hook. So called because all the edges are different, so it fits anywhere. All right, curved edges and these for skirtings, door architraves, anything that may be ornate. Again, a flat edge there for flat skirtings, Okay, and this point gets in just about everywhere. You can get a triangular shave hook, and as the name suggests, the end would be triangular rather than universal. A heavy duty scraper, very good. Two handed use, perhaps for stubborn wallpaper, okay, or even paint on walls if you're trying to remove it, and even tiles. Exercise caution when using these because these blades, when new, are Stanley knife sharp, all right? So just be aware, do not get your hands in front of the blade. But there's your heavy duty scraper, very useful piece of kit. The Stanley knife, again, we can use these if we are trimming paper um, around uh, walls prior to removal or removing stubborn cork from the corners of uh, wall to woodwork edges, all right? Again, a very useful piece of equipment, but again, beware the blade. The putty knife, all right? As the name would suggest, we use this when we're putting putty into window frames, all right? Just for smoothing those off, all right? A very useful piece of kit. The last stripping piece is this, the stripping knife. These comes in all shorts, sorts of shapes and sizes, okay? The stripping knife or a scraper, depending what part of the country you come from, all right? There are certain local uh, differentiations, all right? So that is a... Stripping knife, because the blade barely flexes. This, however, remarkably similar piece of kit, all right, is our filling knife. And this, as you can see, the blade is incredibly flexible. All right, um, that means we can put pressure on the filler when it goes into the wall without dragging it straight back out again, which the stiff blade may do. So filling knife, very flexible. Scraper or stripping knife, very, very solid blade there. Last couple of bits are our wide width filling knives or caulking tools, again, depending where you come from. Again, very, very useful for filling larger areas of walls. Um, this has a metal blade, which again, is quite flexible, right? And this one has a plastic blade. Again, just flexible enough for large areas of filling. And last, but by no means least, our hot air gun, all right? You may be familiar with these. It's basically a hair dryer on steroids. It means we don't have a naked flame when we're burning off um, oil-based paints off doors, skirtings, or whatever. And again, we need to make sure when we are using this that the scraper is in front of the heat source, not our hand, all right? A thick cotton glove would definitely be a handy addition just in case, all right? So that's a hot air gun, right? Used for stripping oil-based paints off walls, woodwork, wherever it may be.